first two lectures, I tried to lay out what we might call the prescriptive description of the gender boundary, the traditional gender boundary and traditional gender hierarchy. Today's lecture and the next two lectures, I'm going to talk about how this prescription was challenged when it met with real life and how in real life, the uh, gender boundary was crossed over, was changed, was moved, and how the hierarchy was also uh, transformed to some extent. Last time we spoke about the fact that for many centuries, there were apparently groups of Jewish women who took upon themselves a stringency that while they were menstruating, they would not enter the synagogue, uh, pray, have anything to do with anything holy. And that by the 13th century, at least some halachic authorities made this custom into something that people had to do. Now, somebody I've mentioned so far in every lecture, the rabbi of Krakow in the 16th century, Moshe Israelis, who wrote the Ashkenazic part of the Shulchan Aruch, the Jewish code of law, paid some attention to this uh, stringency. And he wrote, there are those who wrote that a menstruant woman should not enter the synagogue or pray or speak God's name or touch the Torah on the days that she sees blood. So that was a custom that was pretty much an obligation by his time. But he says, there are those who say that she is permitted to do all of these things. This is the primary ruling. In other words, there really is no Talmudic basis for forbidding menstruating women coming into the synagogue or praying or speaking God's name or all of these things. However, the custom in these lands is according to the first opinion. So in his time in Krakow, in Poland in general, uh, people still held by this restriction. But during the white days, that is after the Menzies stopped, a woman has to wait seven days before going to the mikvah, the ritual bath, before resuming sexual relations. So during the white days, they practice leniency. In other words, if a woman still had not gone to the mikvah, but the menses had ceased, she could go to the synagogue. Even where the custom was strict on the high holy days and such, when many gathered to go to the synagogue, the menstruants were permitted to do so. So what I think you see here is that this practice, which had the effect of keeping women's attendance in synagogue uh, somewhat restricted and keeping them, again, as uh, second class participants, this re restriction was being contested. And you see back and forth. Some people wanted to continue doing it. Some people pressed that women should always be allowed to go into the synagogue. And you see that Rabbi Israelis is going back and forth with uh, this restriction. So there is pressure from both sides, pressure to keep it, pressure to change it. Now let's talk about gender in the marketplace. While we spoke last time how the uh, prescription is that a man is supposed to support his family, in fact, we have here an example from the 18th century in Krakow, where there was a dispute between husband and wife, and the husband claimed that he did not require his wife to go to Krakow to do business and make a livelihood for the couple and their children, as is the way of men and women. In other words, both members of the couple normally were expected to participate in earning money for the family unit. 
they were not only marital partners, they were economic partners. Here you see a picture of a jupan or a jupitsa. This is a traditional Polish uh, garment. It's fur-lined, uh, it has suede on the outside. And I show it to you because uh, Rabbi Yoel Sirkis, known as the Bach, uh, the Bayit Padash, the, after the work that he wrote, in the Bayit Padash, talks about the question whether a woman in the marketplace may wear a jupitsa, which is a man's garment, because the Bible forbids cross-dressing. And he says, well, she's not wearing it as an ornament, and she's not wearing it for transvestism, as people sometimes do at parties to pretend that they belong to the other gender. She's wearing it to keep warm, so it's permitted. This is telling us that women were in the marketplace. Women were sitting in the stalls, at the stands, in the stores, just like men. Now, before I said that men and women, husbands and wives, had to share earning a living for the family. And I know that in popular lore, people often say that uh, in Eastern Europe, the men were all scholars and the women supported the family. Well, that's a gross, gross exaggeration as you just saw from the uh, source that I brought. <clears throat> but there is such a thing as a woman who supports her family, perhaps because her husband was a scholar, but there are very few of those, more likely because her husband was disabled in some way and couldn't work. And this is the case of this lady, Mrs. Temerol, who is called an Eshet Chayel. Now, Eshet Chayel, woman of valor, which comes from the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs. In our context, this is a technical term. An Eshet Chayel is, like Mrs. Temerol, like merchant ships, bringing sustenance to her household, not sleeping, working doubly hard day and night. She is the support of her family. That's an Eshet Chayel. So there are some women like this, but this is not the norm, it's not standard, but it is a phenomenon that exists. Asia Chayel, a woman who supports her family. But let's talk about some common female occupations. The typical woman would be what I call an untitled partner with her husband. Her husband was a shoemaker, the wife was the assistant shoemaker. Uh, the husband was uh, a baker. The wife was the assistant baker. So the wife was often the partner of her husband without benefit of title. Then there is the Jadówka. Now the word Jadówka in Polish literally means a female Jew. What Once upon a time we would say a Jewess. But this is again a technical term. A zhiduvka in the early modern period means a Jewish woman who, usually with her husband, runs an inn. And she's the one who serves the food, deals with the customers, takes care of the sleeping quarters, jokes around with everybody. Uh, she, if you will, is the uh, mother of the inn. Money lending. Since money lending is something you could do from home, you could even do while you're taking care of children. Heavy money lending on pawns was to a very great extent the realm of women in the early modern period. We can see that because we see when, when the <clears throat> money lenders come to court to get permission to cash in the pawn, many, if not most, of the signatures are female or women. And I mentioned before, men might be bakers, but also we have women who are bakers in their own right. Uh, we have lists of taxpayers. Uh, I saw, for example, such lists in Vilna uh, in the 18th century, where there are many women bakers, although the majority of bakers were men. <clears throat> and then we have merchants of all kinds. 
from international merchants, somebody like Glickel uh, Hamel, to the woman who sits in a store or a uh, man's stand or a uh, walks around with a cart in the marketplace. And then there's something called arenda. Arenda is leasing a, a concession on a nobleman's estate. That means you get the right to collect taxes, you get the right to run the mill, to uh, run the tavern, to manufacture liquor. In some cases, you even are in charge of the agricultural production, which means that you uh, are in charge of the serfs. So we have all kinds of arendas and women at different levels of arenda. So there's someone like Shana. Now this Shana lives in the 18th century. <clears throat> Her husband was an arendator, but he died. And after he died, Shana did not know how to run the arendas. <clears throat> she didn't know how to manage the money. She didn't know how to get the supplies. She didn't want to deal with the customers. And she desperately sought someone to take it off of her hands so she would not have to run it and pay the fees. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have someone like Devorah Shimshitz who lived in the Pinsk area in the 17th century. After her husband died, she was the arrendator of three different towns and about a dozen villages, more than a thousand serfs that she was in charge of. And she was a rather aggressive person. When uh, the inhabitants of one village did not pay the taxes that she thought that they were obligated to pay, she showed up with a posse of armed men to make them pay. Or Vega Levitova. This was a woman who outbid a man named Mayor Yakovovich for the lease of uh, a certain area of a, a town with its villages. And then over the next several years, there was a battle going on between Fega and Mayer, who would get this lease. After she successfully bid on the lease, he kept harassing her. Uh, at some point, there was uh, an argument in the synagogue. She claimed that uh, one of his men beat up her son in the marketplace. So, uh, she had to stand on her rights. And then we have the phenomenon of women peddlers, peddlerin. This was very common for women to be peddlers and to go into the countryside from place to place. And this was a practice that some communal leaders and some rabbis did not approve of. <clears throat> and so we, have several legislative attempts to restrict or even forbid women peddlers. And it's interesting to read the reasons why they wanted to restrict them. One reason was they trespass in sin, desecrating the Shabbat and holidays. In other words, uh, they're tempted uh, perhaps to stay out too late on Friday or maybe even to go out on Shabbat to uh, make sales. Second reason given, their children are borderline bastards, mamzerim. In other words, uh, women who are going around to Christian homes, there is a suspicion that there might be some kind of uh, sexual activity going on. And finally, they deny the livelihood of many householders and merchants. Now, perhaps this is really what was bothering them. And that is uh, when peddlers go out and bring people merchandise so they don't have to come into town and uh, patronize the stores, the merchants. So you can imagine that there may be some merchants who did not like the competition that these female peddlers pose. Uh, there were, as I said, several attempts to restrict them. For example, at one point, 
in the 17th century, there was a rule passed that uh, any woman peddler who goes out has to be chaperoned by at least one man and one boy. Why the boy? So if the man has to go away for some reason, as they say, even to go to the washroom, so at least the boy will be there with her. And this is ostensibly to protect her virtue. But we see that this was not observed. Later on, they tried to restrict it completely. Again, life, <laughs> the uh, exigencies of economics were too strong. And in the end, they had to uh, agree and let the women peddlers buy their trade. Now, last week we talked about mentality, mentalite, that is how people conceived of their role, largely connected to their being men or women. So I'll give you some examples of how women in the period we're talking about uh, thought about their role in business or how they, they were thought of by others in business. <clears throat> this is a sentence that I found spoken by a Zhidufka, by one of those Jewish women running a tavern. So at one point she's running an inn and some gypsies come in and they wanna buy uh, some amount of liquor. When she sees them, she says to a customer, since her husband is away, she asks one of the Jewish customers to deal with them because she says, as a man, you better know how to bargain. In other words, bargaining, that's for men. That's not women's job. As the Yudubka, there are things that I do, but there are things I don't do. That's a man's job to bargain. Or another Yudubka, it was a Friday uh, late afternoon. Her husband had already gone to the synagogue because Shabbat was coming. And some non-Jewish travelers came in. And as was customary, they gave her, or they wanted to give her their money for safekeeping. The innkeeper would keep the valuables. And eventually these valuables disappeared and there was a court case. So she said that she did not want to take the money from them for safekeeping because of Shabbat, Shabbat had already started. And because her husband was not there dealing with money, that's the man's job. On the other hand, if we go to the other end of the spectrum, one of, if not the richest Jewish family in Krakow in the mid 17th century was the Kozhekovsky family. The husband's name was Todros or David. And the wife was Gittel, Gittel Kozhekovsky. Todros died and left a will. And in his will, he says the following about Gittel, his wife. She is to deal in all business that there is according to her desire and will, as she has always done because she is the lady of the house, dominant and ruling over the entire estate and the business for all of her days. In other words, what I said in the beginning that women were partners with their husbands, here we have an example of partnership at the highest level. Gittel was a full partner with her husband and when he died, he felt she takes over the whole thing. Or, the woman that we're going to speak about in two weeks, Glickel Hamel, on his deathbed, her husband said, when he was asked, what do you want to, to, do you want to write a will, give instructions? He said, I have nothing to will. My wife knows about everything. Let her do as she has done up to now. And if you read Glickel's memoirs, you see that she was certainly a full partner with Chaim, her husband. So we have women who say, as a man, you do the bargaining, I don't take care of the money. And then we have these women who were something like the Catherine Grahams of their day. Now, what about halakha? 
We spoke last time about halakhic institutions that emphasized the gender border and the gender hierarchy, putting men in a more powerful position than women. We talked about marriage, divorce, and several other things. Well, really beginning in the Middle Ages, but it crystallizes and is codified in the period we're talking about, uh, we find various expediencies to ameliorate the gender hierarchy and to somewhat move the border and improve women's position in personal status issues vis-a-vis -vis men. Uh, this book, Nachalat Shiva, written by Rabbi uh, Shmuel ben David Halevi in the 17th century, is a collection of various forms that uh, you have to use. Uh, a form for a, a, a get, a divorce, a form for a ketubah, a marriage contract. And we find some interesting forms here that did not exist in the Middle Ages, although these forms built on practices that began developing as, as far uh, long ago as the Talmud. So we have Tanaim. Tanaim literally means conditions. This kind of contract was drawn up at the time of betrothal. And it made very clear that both sides were parties to this uh, marriage. Unlike the uh, marriage ceremony where the man is the active party, in this, both sides, the bride and the groom, the bride's family, the groom's family, first of all, undertake to indeed have the marriage and then talk about all of the arrangements connected to the marriage, especially the dowry, who's going to pay the dowry and how much uh, sometimes both sides pay, sometimes one side pays. Also, what would happen if the betrothal was broken off? Uh, what would happen after the marriage if the bride died within a year? And various other conditions. Then there's also something called the Shtar Chalitza, a formula for chalitza, we talked about this last time, chalitza is when a man dies without children, according to biblical law, his brother is supposed to marry his wife and have children on the dead brother's name. However, he can refuse to do so. And if he does, he has to uh, undergo a ceremony called chalitza. And we mentioned that this could be a source of extortion that the widow, the young widow could not remarry until she was granted chalitza. And you could see how the brother-in-law brother might use this to get money for her, from her. So by the uh, 16th century, we have something called the shtar chalitza or shtar chiyuv chalitza, the contract that obligates someone to give chalitza. <clears throat> That is that the brothers of the groom were to sign this form saying that in the case of the brother's death, of the groom's death, they would indeed go through with the chalitza ceremony. And they also talked about financial uh, arrangements. That is what part of the brother's estate would go to the widow and what would go to her brothers, to his brothers. And then there's something called Shtar Chatzi Zahar. Again, this was not a new problem. According to biblical law, if there are male children, the female children do not inherit. But of course, people want their daughters to inherit and there were all sorts of devices to do this. Again, by the 16th century, we have codification of this formula which says that the father writes a contract that uh, 
one hour before his death, he is granting his daughter a half share in his uh, estate. That is, she gets half of what her brothers would get. This is in addition to any dowry that she received when she got married. And then we also spoke about two other institutions, Menek and Chavero, the uh, prohibition on a young widow who has a child on her remarrying for until she has nursed her child for at least two years. And of course, we, this restricts her. She can't remarry. However, in our period, the early modern period, there were all sorts of ways of getting around this. Uh, it, it was a divorce rather than widowhood. So you could say her former husband was responsible for feeding the child. In some cases, women would not even start nursing and just hire a wet nurse right away. So no one could say that the baby was being shifted from one woman to another. Uh, and in some cases, rabbis just looked the other way. The same thing with katla meat. According to rabbinic law, a woman who has been widowed twice cannot marry a third time. She has a stigma because two of her husbands died. Beginning in the Middle Ages and through our period, this was almost always ignored. It was not enforced. And now let's talk about literature. We spoke in the past lectures about the fact that women and ignorant men, that's Am Haaretz, uh, did not know. The Mishnah says that they did not understand the Megillah, or we saw last week in the Shulchan Aruch, they did not understand the grace after meals, and they didn't have to know. Well, in our period, we have the development of a new literature in Yiddish. And one of the books in Yiddish called the Branchspiegel famously says, this book is written in Yiddish for women and for men who are like women in not being able to learn much. In other words, we now have the idea, and this also started in the Middle Ages, that women and Ameha Aretz, ignorant men, have a right to know. They should know. It's important for them to know. They should be educated. And so now we have a literature in Yiddish that gives them access to Jewish knowledge. So I'll give you some examples of books that are published in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. This is a book we already mentioned. This is a modern edition of Seder Mitzvot Nashim, a book about the three special commandments for women, that is separating a piece of the dough when baking challah, lighting candles on Shabbat, and all of the laws uh, concerned with the female biological cycle. This is one of the best sellers of Jewish history, Senarena, often called the Women's Bible. It is a Yiddish retelling of the Bible, which includes many of the rabbinic midrashim, the rabbinic interpretations, so that someone who read this or listened to it sitting around the table on Friday night <clears throat> would get a pretty good idea of how a Jew is supposed to understand the Bible based on rabbinic interpretation. And this is a modern edition of prayers called Tefinis, that is supplicatory prayers that were said uh, if someone was sick in the family, if uh, the husband was away on business, uh, prayers to get pregnant, prayers to have an easy pregnancy and an easy birth, uh, prayers when lighting candles, prayers when going to the cemetery, etc., etc. In the 18th century, we have the phenomenon of prayers to be said in Yiddish in the synagogue by women. This is the Bubba book. I don't have time to get into it. It's the story of knights and dragons. Uh, 
uh, it wasn't originally in Yiddish, it was in uh, various other European languages, but uh, in the late 15th century, it was translated uh, into Yiddish. So it was a kind of religiously correct fiction literature, uh, again, where women and ignorant men, although I have a feeling it wasn't just ignorant men that read it. And this book representing a whole genre of literature, this book is called Lev Tov of uh, Conduct Literature. How should a Jew behave? Again, in Yiddish and uh, addressed to men and women, but the point for us here is that women had access to this literature, either to read it or to have it read to them. And here we have the first book that we know of published by a Jewish woman. Her name was Rivka Tichtener. She published in Prague in 1609, second edition 1618, a book called Menekes Rivka, which is a conduct book. Now there's some very interesting differences between this book and parallel literature written by men. First of all, I have to read to you what the publisher, the printer, had to say. He had to give an apologia that he was publishing something written by a woman. His name was Gershom Ben Vassalov Katz. He lived in Prague, he was a famous printer. Who has ever heard or seen such a novelty? Has it ever happened in countless years that a woman has written something of her own accord? And she has read numerous verses and midrashim. I let it therefore be printed so that every woman, God forbid that a man should read it, who wishes to read it can buy and possess a copy. She named the book Menekes Rivka to be a commemoration for herself and in honor of all women. It shows that a woman can also compose words of ethical instruction and good biblical interpretations as well as many men. You can teach a bear to dance. So Rivka wrote her book. She makes no mention of the three special women's mitzvot that we talked about before, because as we said last week, these mitzvot, halakhically speaking, have no special status. And women have many more mitzvot to observe than these three. She also says this. Now, if you read the book by Rabbi Benjamin Slonik that we saw before, the modern edition of Seder Mitzvot Nashim, where he does concentrate on the three mitzvot, he keeps repeating throughout the book, the woman is responsible. The woman is responsible. And what is she responsible for? If things go wrong, if, God forbid, a child is born with some kind of birth defect, it's because the woman did something wrong. Or if there's some other uh, calamity, the woman is responsible. Well, Rivka also says the woman is responsible, but look at what she says. The Gemara goes on. Blessing is only found in a man's house due to his wife. As it says, blessing is in a man's house due to his wife's merits. When she sees him do something improper, she should disallow it because a pious wife makes her husband pious. She could discuss everything with him amicably. And get this, he will certainly obey her and she him. They will merit having children who will be Torah scholars. So this woman <clears throat> presents marriage as an arrangement with mutuality, with love, uh, with each partner obeying the other. Now, last week I brought a Hasidic text that we might call a misogynist, which made it clear that women's purpose is to be an instrument for men's observing mitzvot, fulfilling the Torah. But that book, Shavata Rivash, came out in the late 18th century. In the early 19th century, in the year uh, 
1815, uh, we see two books that came out, books of stories, the stories about the Baal Shem Tov, and the stories of Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlav. And what's interesting about these stories is the women are subjects, not just objects. In Shibre Abesh, the women have names. In both of the books, there are stories where the woman is the protagonist. The woman is the hero. She has agency. She makes decisions. She solves problems. And also, if you see the Baal Shem Tov and his wife, they have a marriage that Ritza Tichtener would have approved of. There's mutuality, there's respect, there's love. And now let's talk about the synagogue. And again, I want to uh, acknowledge that what I'm going to say largely draws on the work of Ilya Rudov and especially Vladimir Levin. So last week we said that by the end of the Middle Ages, there were two basic models of synagogue for women. Women as guests in the synagogue with the temporary uh, partition and what we call the hierarchical synagogue. Women in a women's synagogue, vibrational, that was an afterthought usually built later, uh, a lower building barely attached to the main synagogue. So here we have Rabbi Israelis's synagogue, the Ramu synagogue built in 1558. And this is a hierarchical synagogue. You see the main hall and the vibrant will attached to it. And here's what it looks like inside. Here is where the women could look down on what was going on. So yes, hierarchical, but in the late 16th or early 17th century, this annex was added to the building. This is facing east to the Aron Kodesh, to the Torah Ark. So in other words, women could come down from way up there and sit on the same level as the men, of course, still hierarchical. But then, Synagogues being built in the 17th century, we see a new model. This is the Pinka Synagogue in Prague. You can visit it today. And when it was remodeled in 1625, they put in an Enrat Nachim, that is a women's section, two stories, under the same roof as the men's section. So now the women are in the same building as the men. It's not hierarchical anymore. The women are in the building. And then there's a third new arrangement. This is the Zaka Synagogue in Krakow, built in 1644. Here, there's a women's gallery. The gallery and the main hall are under the same ceiling as uh, Levin points out. We have not only under the same roof, but the same ceiling. In other words, they're in the same room. The men and the women are in the same room. On the other hand, in the small town of Gvozhdjets, which is today in Ukraine, the synagogue there, originally built here, in 1640, later they added this lean-to as Rat Nashim. And then there was a general remodeling in uh, 1729 to 31. Well, this is somewhat of a throwback uh, to something very hierarchical. Here you see a cross section. This is the Rat Nashim. This is the main hall and this is what communicates between the women and the men. And this is what it looks like in real life. These splits in the wood, 
Obviously, the women are not involved in whatever service is going on in the men's section. So what I think this shows is, on the one hand, we have gradual movement of the women inside of the synagogue. They get more space and better space. The separation between the women and the men is progressively less strict. And this reflects that women are increasingly attending synagogue. And we know this from the women's liturgy, the fact that there are now, as I mentioned before, Tapinas prayers that are designed to be said in the synagogue on Shabbat. So that means women should be in the synagogue. Women are attending the synagogue. Now, what we saw in Gvozhyech, the small town in, deep in Ukraine, perhaps compared to the synagogue in Krakow, which was a private synagogue. It was built by a private individual. That's why it's called the Izaka Synagogue. It was built by Yitzchak Yekel. Uh, perhaps what we're seeing here is that number one, a private, privately financed synagogue could be a little more daring and have the women under the same ceiling as the men while the country synagogue was more conservative and kept a very hierarchical uh, arrangement. And the women were almost completely excluded from what was going on in the men's section. Also, I should point out that Levin has studied this and showed that the model of uh, women and men under the same ceiling really didn't catch on until the late 18th, early 19th century. So it was pioneered in Krakow in 1644, but uh, it didn't become popular until later. So what we've seen is a very gradual rise in women's cultural capital in the early modern period. First of all, in economic activity, halakhically, we see various halakhic devices that are designed to strengthen women's position in the gender hierarchy, to move the gender boundary somewhat. We see a new literature that women have access to so that they can be more knowledgeable about Judaism. And we see that women are given the opportunity to be to more fully participate in the synagogue. Again, I emphasize that the innovations were very sporadic and very gradual. And there was resistance, as we saw in the first slide with uh, the Ramo, that some people want women in the synagogue, some people don't, or the Gavajit synagogue versus the city synagogues that we saw. So the gender boundary can move, the gender hierarchy can be softened, and gender is continually under construction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me begin by thanking our hosts, Fordham University's incomparable team led by Professor Magda Tedder and Professor Sarit Katan Gribitz this year. Um, and thank you, Professor Rossman, for a rich and thought-provoking series um, accompanied by some spectacular illustrations, which I really enjoyed uh, learning from. So I want to begin by just um, uh, picking up two strands of what you've um, drawn in terms of uh, the overall arc of the series. Um, maybe you want to respond to them briefly, and then I want to pick up uh, on some of the specifics. Um, so my first point or question to you or opening uh, concerns the, the notion of a line of gender gradually moving toward um, a 21st century conception of equity um, within Jewish life and Jewish sources. 
Um, I would question whether it moves in a straight line. Um, was Dolce of Varms, who was arguably just as much of a um, businesswoman and a pious woman and had a lot of cultural capital. Um, she was a 12th century woman um, who we know about because she was killed possibly because of her aggressiveness in business, um, according to some scholars. Um, and then after the uh, 12th, 13th century, uh, we have a kind of regression. And then in the early modern period, um, an efflorescence of women uh, in the spotlight in various different um, cultural spaces. And then by the 19th century, women are back in the domestic sphere again, or at least in Western Europe, uh, that becomes the ideal again. Um, so I think we have to be a little bit careful of painting um, gender hierarchy and gender boundaries as moving in a teleological way toward what today we might consider uh, a more equitable relationship. So that's just one point. And another larger point I want to ask, um, to paraphrase the title of a wonderful book by uh, this Professor Moshe Rossman, um, I want to ask how Jewish was what you call Jewish gender? You asked that question about Jewish history. Um, in many of the areas you describe, just for example, um, business, how much of Jewish economic activity and the um, possibilities for Jewish, wish, Jewish women had something to do with an internal Jewish cultural shift? Um, instead, what we seem to be witnessing are uh, changes in what Jews can or cannot do in the marketplace um, and women um, either by desire or necessity uh, filling spaces where they can. Uh, but I'm not sure women, for example, uh, taking advantage of market conditions in Poland, um, is that an expression of Jewish gender um, or is this opportunities that Jews are being given in Poland, um, all over the world, the types of trades that Jews could ply, the uh, kinds of uh, inhibitions, confiscations, um, all of this is not really inherently Jewish, um, although, again, it allows Jews, men and women, uh, to occupy spaces in the economy that they might not otherwise have occupied. So those are two um, larger points that I wanted to make. And then uh, if you want to respond to them, fine. And if not, I'll go on to some other things. OK. So I tried to emphasize that it's not linear, that there is resistance. Uh, perhaps I could have said that when the gender boundary moves, it can move in both directions. It doesn't just move in one direction. But the fact, I also tried to explain that this is gradual, and I even use the word sporadic when I talk about the synagogue. So yes, obviously it goes back and forth. And uh, you could also give a series of lectures on resistance to these innovations. As to the second point, this has come up so far in every lecture. Uh, when you call a certain occupation the Zhidufka, that means it was dominated by Jewish women. And uh, yes, obviously, Jews share a cultural, social, economic band of activity with people with whom they live. Everybody believed in the same economic theory. Everybody believed, uh, as far as women were concerned, as we've talked about before, that the ideal woman is chaste, silent, and obedient. Everybody believed that, Jews, Christians. Uh, yes, what I'm talking about is the Jewish iteration of these uh, basic trends, phenomena, whatever we call them. Okay. Um, 
So I, I wanted to move on to um, look a little bit more closely, and I'm not um, in, in this opposing what you've shown us, uh, but hopefully um, maybe expanding what you're looking at a little bit. Uh, let's begin with synagogue architecture, which featured last time and this time pretty prominently as well. Um, and I hope that you will not just look at the place of the Ezra Nashim and the height of the synagogue for men versus the height of the synagogue for women. Um, but rather, let's think about uh, what are women doing inside the synagogue? I know that this came up last time as well. Professor Kaplan noted last week um, that women had a very rich life within the synagogue space. Um, not only did they play a role um, within their own society as fear zogarins, gaba otsudaka. I'm thinking about an article published by Avraham Ya'ari uh, in the 1940s um, in which women of Jerusalem uh, beg the women of, I think it was Frankfurt or some uh, Western, I, I don't remember which city it was, uh, to please collect Sadaka amongst themselves for points um, in the life cycle of Jewish women. Um, so they, and send it with a special emissary to the Jewish women. They have their own social hierarchy, their own rich spiritual life. Uh, think about the parochot they sew, the bimas, um, the mantles, the sashes for Torah, the candles um, whose wicks they, they make. Um, they, they turn synagogues with their creativity into beautiful sanctuaries, but you can't really know this if you just measure the exterior dimensions. And not only synagogues, why aren't we looking at mikvaot, which were purpose built pretty much for women? Um, some of them are absolutely marvels of expense and architecture going all the way back to the Middle Ages, as well as new ones, um, deep into the stone earth, sometimes hundreds of steps until they hit groundwater beneath with beautiful niches for women to prepare themselves. And we know from the trinas and other materials that women felt very deeply about these rituals and thought about this as a way of preparing and purifying themselves for God, the highest calling in pre-modern spirituality. So rather than looking at Jewish gender through the eyes of the males who built the synagogue, let's think about women as actors in their own right. Um, you know, to take your Polish Jewish woman entrepreneur who manages a household of many children and servants and a business um, and has a very rich spiritual life. You know, yes, her husband prays in a synagogue with a higher ceiling, but you know, whose categories are these actor and facilitator? In her own eyes, she may be very much of an actor, um, and not just a facilitator for what her husband does. Um, I want to talk about Meinekes Rivka uh, for a moment, and you um, highlight it's, um, you know, it's a wonderful work uh, that has recently been translated into English by Frauke von Roden, uh, very much recommended for people who want to hear um, this genre from a woman's voice. And it is absolutely striking that she doesn't follow uh, in the footsteps of so many prescriptive male um, writers uh, speaking about those three so-called women's mitzvot, chala, nida, and hadlaka, the mitzvot chana, uh, candle lighting, uh, chala, and uh, menstrual purity. Um, but how representative is Rivka Tiktiner? Uh, we know, for example, um, that in so many Sidurim that women commission and have written for themselves, uh, those three mitzvot are highlighted and illustrated. Um, so there are so many other women's voices in this period that while I don't want to displace the importance of Rivka Tiktiner, um, again, one voice isn't necessarily representative of all of them. And I'm wondering if we could um, think about that. 
And then I want to make one more point about sources, and then maybe you want to um, rejoin her. Um, and that is, um, you haven't said anything about women in the courts, uh, both in the Jewish courts, but maybe more importantly in non-Jewish courts. Uh, women have recourse here and a great deal of power uh, to play different legal systems against one another. Uh, the idea of legal pluralism for Jews with scholars of uh, legal history have been um, really uh, building out for us over the past years. Uh, Jewish women are quite savvy, um, almost from the beginning of when a court becomes available as a space for Jews to litigate, Jewish women are there. Um, and they're, you know, like every other person who comes to court, they may have a representative, um, but some of them represent themselves and they're not shy about that. Um, and this is in both business things, but also to sometimes uh, women use it as a threat, um, the outside courts, to balance the imbalance of power within Jewish law. Um, so men who don't want to give a divorce might find themselves with a wife who says, you don't give me that divorce, I'm going to convert to Christianity and you're going to lose my soul and your children's. Um, because very often uh, the non-Jewish court awarded uh, children to the converting parent. Um, so this is something else that I'm hoping you might think about uh, in terms of sources to look at when we think about gender. So let me stop for a minute and have you react and then we could talk some more if you want. So have time. as far as the first point, yes, obviously women uh, had a spiritual life. And we talked last week about uh, women as, as spiritual experts and doing, sacralizing these activities that you alluded to. Uh, yes, it, it should be developed. Uh, I was talking about the architecture of the synagogues. I think that they show something. I also think something else. I think that behind the removes uh, contested discussion of whether menstruants can come to the synagogue or not, and behind the changes in synagogue architecture is pressure from women. I think it's women who want to be in the synagogue. There's a demand by women to uh, participate more, to be present more, to have their own liturgy. And we're going to, next week, we're going to speak about Leah Horvitz, who wrote a prayer for women to say in the synagogue. And she says, what are you complaining about? You say that women talk during services, I'm giving them something to do instead of talking, to pray in Yiddish. Uh, so this is pressure from women to have a more active role. I think you make an excellent point when you say that uh, women didn't see what they were doing as facilitating, but rather for them, it was a source of spiritual fulfillment. Yes. Now, the second point. Remind me the second point. <laughs> um, second, I spoke about, um, uh, we spoke about court records. That was the last point. The third one. Um, I have to look myself at, at what I made as uh, the various points. The mikvah oat, if you would, if you would comment. No. Well, that's, I think that's something that no one has researched really. It has to be, uh, it has to be researched. Uh, by the way, what you said about the women in Jerusalem, Adam Teller's new book, he has uh, quite a large section on that whole episode. Yes, and Professor Deborah Kaplan's book as well, recently, Her Patrons and the Poor, um, it's treated. It. So it's a, it's a well-known, um, it's a well-known episode that highlights the fact that women had their own chevrot. Um, they didn't, you know, yes, they were excluded in many cases from the male yes. well, you can see or associations, you can but they, see but they were facilitating their own spiritual lives in many different ways. And therefore, even though men may have seen them as facilitators, 
you know, so whose lens are we looking through at Jewish gender? Are we looking at women from the point of view of male prescriptive, all different types of sources, or are we looking at it uh, from the point of view of the actors um, who didn't necessarily see what they were doing as purely in um, a facilitating or serving uh, position, but rather their own spiritual pathway to God, which was um, as Hasidism later itself tried to um, accomplish, uh, an alternate pathway to the one that was the official prescriptive one. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> Pinkasim, I can show you that in the annual election, uh, where they elected the, the Parnassim and the Tuvim and whatever, uh, in some places they elected Gabatot or Gabaot, Gabatis. Uh, and yes. their job, as you said, was to collect the tzedakah from the women. There also is some resistance to women collecting tzedakah because it gives them too much power, too much independence. See, uh, but e even there, you've got to look at Europe wide. It wasn't just in synagogue councils or Jewish community life that women could not be elected even to the smallest villages uh, board. This was all over Europe. This is yes. not Jewish gender. This is a universal gendered world, um, which Jews are adapting to, to the best of their ability. Um, and that uh, last time you, you had a quote about uh, Jews not, Jewish women not being able to sit on any council, um, that's actually something that was borrowed uh, from the English um, when Queen Elizabeth was crowned, uh, people grumbled that you couldn't even have a woman sit on the least council in any village in England, and here we are making a woman queen of England. Um, so this is not a Jewish thing. This is something that was pretty universal throughout every village and, and city in, in Europe. So, so I want to transition to some of the questions. We are running out of time, but okay. I wanted to, to uh, actually tie to this sort of question of women's agency and the role. And that one of the questions is about the entrance of women into the synagogues and the chain, changing nature of, uh, of architecture and so on and so forth. To what extent it was, um, it was a, a reflection of changing na nature of what uh, made up the character of synagogue activities and were women part of making that change or were they reflecting it only? So were women part of that transformation or was it, was it just a reflection of broader trends, I guess? Well, I think that we really answered that already. My assumption is that at least part of the reason for these changes was pressure from women, that women wanted uh, more, better participation. Uh, I, I don't disagree. Also, as women, as, as women were able to learn more from the Yiddish literature, uh, they could make more intelligent demands and back them up with reasoning, as we'll see with the two ladies we're going to meet in the next two weeks. Okay, I, I, I want to thank you for oh, a I wonderful one. Yeah. One thing we yeah. asked about representativeness. How representative? Uh, I don't claim that Rivka Tichtener is representative. Obviously, she's unique. She wrote a book and it was published, and no one else did it for another 100 years. Uh, no other woman. So she's not typical in any way. That's not the point. There are two points here. Number one, the difference between the way she writes and the way the men write, which you also pointed out. And number two, as I've said before, the margin tells you where the center is. If the margin is here, the center is here. If the margin is here, the center is here. So the fact that this is introduced makes it a possibility. It's going to take a long time before it becomes a reality. And it's also within structures that are male controlled, right? The printer is a man. Yes. It has to go through those communal structures. 
one more, uh, I think one more, maybe two more questions. One was about the Naim and the, whether this was really an example of gender equality or was it maybe an, uh, an example of the negotiations within, within two families? I, I didn't talk about equality. I didn't use the word equality. <laughs> it's not equality, but it does uh, require the bride to consent explicitly to the marriage. That was the point. And yes, it's mainly between two families. Obviously, the, uh, the parents are the ones uh, supplying the money and making the arrangement. Uh, typically, the bride and groom were rather young, perhaps not as young as people assume, but uh, it's mainly so between parents, yes. I want to add one more thing about that, which is if we look at wills at the end of people's lives, you can see how um, the tna'im that went into the construction of a marriage are sometimes referred to in the disposition of people's estate. Um, so these are um, arrangements that last a couple uh, through their lives and, and down to the next generation. Um, and they really do change the economic balance between the two parties in a marriage. And uh, one uh, more, maybe both of you can clarify because I think that's a, a, a very uh, popular question that usually comes up about the Yiddish literature whether it was really for women or who were, who were the readers of that literature that was supposed to be. Okay, written. so it was, it says it's for women and men. And there are uh, very few books that say they're explicitly for women. I think Kava uh, Ternyasi found something like nine books, something like that, that are explicitly for women. Almost all the books say in the beginning, this is for, uh, women and men, boys and girls, because they wanted to sell as many books as they could. And also, the majority of men were not Talmud scholars. They might be able to listen to a, a, a sermon, a drasha, but to sit down and, and actually learn Talmud themselves, they couldn't. And I assume women, uh, men liked a good story as much as women did, as far as a, a book like uh, uh, the Bava book. So uh, this literature, I tried to emphasize, it's not just for women, but it is accessible to women. That's the point. Unlike the uh, canonic literature, which was not accessible to most women because it was in Hebrew or Aramaic, this was accessible to them. It also was accessible to men who couldn't uh, handle a Hebrew or Aramaic text. So I want to end just by saying that one of our members of the audience says that uh, he has a Hevra Kadisha cup made by women from the early 1800s. So there is a material reminder of the role of women and their Hevrot that uh, we were discussing. I want to thank both of you for your for the time and for this wonderful enlightening uh, session. And uh, and if you want to, if you have any parting words, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, I want thank to thank you, Professor yeah. Rossman for, a, a, again, a very thought-provoking, interesting series um, that, that opens up so many different avenues for exploration. I hope you will continue to um, move in, in that direction, expanding um, our horizons as, we, as you move forward. Well, thank you for expanding some of my horizons. <laughs> Thank you both. And I hope everybody will join us back next week, same time, same place. Uh, please RSVP and uh, looking forward to not seeing you, but, uh, but welcoming you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.